This is a mechanism of disease map for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, also called BPPV. Now, BPPV is the most common cause of peripheral vertigo, and we'll be talking about its etiology, its pathophysiology, and its manifestations. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and we'll be clearing each of these boxes and each of the arrows and talking about them as we repopulate the entire flowchart. Let's go ahead and get started with the pathophysiology. The pathophysiology of BPPV ends with the abnormal stimulation of the vestibular apparatus, which leads to the abnormal stimulation of the vestibulocochlear nerve. Now, this all begins with these otoconia that are free-floating in the semicircular canals. And there's a diagram here to help us orient ourselves to what's going on. Your ear, your inner ear, each side has three semicircular canals, and they're all kind of aligned with the different axes, with each of the three spatial dimensions in which we move our heads and bodies. Within these semicircular canals, you'll have these otoconia, which are essentially tiny little rocks, tiny little crystals made of calcium carbonate. And they move around in this fluid, in this endolymph. And as they move around, they trigger these hair cell filaments that then fire and kind of work their way down through the vestibular apparatus and ha tell our head which position our head is in, or give us a, a, a sense of acceleration and movement and motion. And all of these things happen because these little rocks are in position here on the hair cells and move in the endolymph as we tilt our head. Now, when you have otoconia, when you have these little stones that kind of break off and float around, they're dislodged, as we saw here, that's when you start to have problems. And the BPPV pathophysiology can take one of two directions. You can have canalithiasis, which is when otoconia, those little stones, and debris from the acoustic macula enters the semicircular canals. So the stones kind of don't stay at the bottom here. They work their way into the um, circular parts of the semicircular canals. And the other way that this can cause a problem is cupulolithiasis. This is when otoconial debris adheres to the capula of the affected semicircular canal. So there's an organ in the middle of this called the cupula, and that's what um, helps us determine which stuff is moving and in which direction. And when the otoconia stick to that, you also have a problem. In uh, both cases, you have a trigger that is changing your head position or other gravitational forces around your head that trigger this movement, that trigger this problem. In the case of canalithiasis, you're going to disrupt this endolymph dynamics. So these stones, which are going to be deeper in the semicircular canals, are going to get in the way of the endolymph and mess up the flow of fluid there, and that's going to cause abnormal stimulation of your vestibular apparatus. In the case of cupulolithiasis, you're going to have increased sensitivity of the semicircular canal because these Otoconia are supposed to be triggering the hair cells, which then trigger the cupula, instead of being attached directly to the cupula. So in both cases, you end up with abnormal stimulation, and they're pretty similar. They're quite hard to differentiate clinically, um, but they both end up with the same manifestations. The one difference is that cupulolithiasis might be more implicated in chronic or refractory BPPV. So that might be the pathophysiology in a patient that has a more severe case or a more ongoing long-term case of BPPV. In any case, you have similar etiology, and that's what we'll talk about next. Most of the time, the etiology is unfortunately idiopathic. We don't know what's causing it, and that happens in about 50% or more of BPPV cases. There are also some kind of leads that might predispose somebody to having BPPV. We think it might be secondary to degeneration of the acoustic macula, so that's one possible etiology. It's been associated with head traumas. This includes head injuries like traumatic brain injuries and other quick decelerations of the head. Prior otologic surgeries can also predispose you to BPPV. Other causes of vertigo have been associated with BPPV, so vestibular neuritis and Meniere's disease, which are the second and third most common causes of peripheral vertigo, are also associated with BPPV, which, as we said, was the first most common cause of peripheral vertigo. 
and migraines have also been associated with BPPV. There are some other risk factors. This includes female sex, more than men, increased age, more than younger age, low vitamin D or vitamin D deficiency, as well as osteopenia and osteoporosis. It's thought that osteopenia and osteoporosis might disrupt the bones that are inside the inner ear and might cause problems that way, but the mechanism is not clear. But there is a strong association, or a, 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 at least a, a statistically significant association between osteopenia, osteoporosis, and BPPV. Lastly, it's worth thinking about the triggers that actually cause this um, this movement in head position that might trigger episodes of benign paroxysmal peritoneal vertigo. These include rolling over in bed, bending forwards, suddenly jerking the head to look up or down, and lying down, reclining, or standing up quickly. This last one is especially after a period of sitting still. Um, if you make a quick sudden movement after being stable or still for a while, that predisposes you to this problem. All of these have something in common. They involve quick rotation of the head relative to gravity. So that, of course, is the change in head position that can trigger the problems in benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So we've talked about the etiology and the pathophysiology. Lastly, let's talk about the manifestations. What actually happens when you have abnormal stimulation of the vestibulocochlear nerve? The most prominent symptom, and it's in the name, is vertigo. This is episodic vertigo. So the patient might report a symptom of head spinning or room spinning or their surroundings are spinning and it occurs in episodes. So these episodes tend to last seconds, so usually less than one, one minute, and these episodes tend to kind of be sudden onset. They're paroxysmal. Um, they kind of come out of nowhere um, and they're, they're hard to predict aside from these triggers in movement, these triggers in head motion. So they're positional because they're triggered by these movements in the head, and they typically happen after a latency period. As we mentioned, this um, trigger, lying down, reclining, or standing up too quickly, is worse after the patient's been stable and sitting for a long period of time. In addition to this vertigo, you might have nystagmus on physical exam, and patients might have nausea and vomiting as well. Nausea vomiting has a plus minus here because it's not all that common in BPPV. Usually when you have vertigo with nausea and vomiting, it's due to the other causes of peripheral vertigo, which includes vestibular neuritis and Meniere's disease, which might be longer lasting than BPPV. Remember, BPPV typically lasts minutes, sorry, seconds, less than one minute, and um, that might be too short a time to cause nausea and vomiting, but it's still possible. Of course, any type of vertigo puts you at risk of falls, which can lead to subsequent injuries, and we'll list out some of those later. On physical exam, you can do the dix hall pike maneuver to diagnose BPPV. This is a maneuver where you lay the patient down on their back, you have them open their eyes, and you move their head in a certain direction that's intended to trigger this pathophysiology. That's intended to kind of move around the otoconia or to see if the semicircular canal is extra sensitive to movement of the endolymph. That's the dix Holpike maneuver. So you might see that on, uh, on your board exams. Lastly, these are some longer term or more severe complications of BPPV. As we mentioned, you can have these, uh, this risk of falls with any type of vertigo, and these are the most common kinds of injuries that you might get. You can get bone fractures, including the Collie's fracture and the hip fracture. You can get dislocations, commonly the hip dislocation, and you can get brain injuries like hemorrhagic strokes and concussions from somebody who falls and, hit their, and hits their head. Of course, this disease can be debilitating, and that can, of course, lead to decreased quality of life and depression as well. That's it for this short flow chart on benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. I hope it was helpful, and keep an eye out for other videos on vestibular neuritis and Meniere's disease coming out soon. Thanks for listening.